technologically development uh, developed and can withstand natural phenomena to a greater degree. It's not unaffected, but to a greater degree. In any case, now, I, okay, I've talked about India being an underdeveloped country. Some classic cases, uh, some classic uh, indicators. Let me give you a couple of more indicators of uh, uh, of being uh, an underdeveloped country. Um, excuse me, of a developed country. All right. Some classic indicators that India has which suggest that it is a developed country. Things that are, you don't associate with an underdeveloped country. All right. First off, these things are things you associated with you, uh, developed countries, yet India has them. It possesses nuclear weapons. Now, I know there are, plenty of under, there are a number of underdeveloped countries that have been pursuing these. Nevertheless, we associate nuclear weapons with developed countries. It possesses a nuclear missile uh, delivery system. That's certainly something you associate with developed countries. Right. It has its own space program. How many underdeveloped countries do we associate with in a space program? I believe they were working on their last space shuttle. I don't know where that, uh, excuse me, on a space shuttle. Uh, because India wanted to get into the business of uh, delivering payload into uh, orbit. Uh, that's largely been reserved for uh, the developed countries, specifically France and Russia and the United States. And that's a lucrative business. All right, putting up satellites and the like. You want to get into that business, and so India has been moving into uh, that uh, economy. It possesses a significant scientific community. One notices this if you go to the larger schools in the northeast of the United States, certainly the graduate programs, increasingly more and more numbers of students coming from India because it does have a significant scientific community. It's the world's largest democracy, and it's a stable democracy. We have associated that with, de with uh, economic uh, development. All right, it's imperfect to be sure, but we've associated that with economic development. This is the world's largest democracy. Democracy is not so easy to define, nevertheless. All right, and of course, it has a relatively free press and expression of ideas. So uh, these are traits of, of a developed country. Know what they are. Now, let's move along. There's an observation you want to make about India's borders. India is, of course, a massive country. You can check in, uh, type into the web what the population is. It's going to be somewhere in around 1.3 million. Again, you will never know the exact number. It's not possible to know that, but it's going to be somewhere about in there. 1.3 billion, I should say. And uh, interesting, though, if you look at where this map here, if you look at where that population is located, it doesn't tend to be near the peripheral borders. All right. You can see the borders of India here in the, in the, in the desert regions uh, over here. Is the population density is very low. When you get up here into the Kashmir areas, uh, Kashmir border with China over here, all these are fairly topographically difficult, obscure locations. Population densities are very low. Right. When you get way over here in the northeastern portion of India, you can see the same thing. Here's the borders, but population densities are very low. All right, And so what that means is that uh, India has had a substantial problem with border conflicts because a lot of these peripheral borders, since there's very little population, it's topographically difficult. It's either desert or in, in the northern portion of India, extremely mountainous territory. Uh, it makes it very difficult to agree on a fixed border exactly where that is, all right, since no country on either side of the border has effectively tied the area economically into its national system. Now, with the technological capacities that we have today, you can fix those borders, but at the end of the day, uh, historically, well, that put it this way, that's a relatively modern capacity, all right? If I was to show you certain maps uh, from the latter portion of the 20th century, you'll see that India has had various border conflicts with its neighbors. All right, it's actually had a war with one neighbor over here over exactly where the border was. And that indicates another problem that you want to take note of with respect to India, and that is that uh, India, India's borders uh, threaten all of its neighbors. Look at Pakistan. We already talked about Pakistan. India's borders is pressing right onto the core of Pakistan. In fact, the key tributary rivers here are being fed from India into Pakistan. So India, Pakistan feels threatened. 
Nepal here is almost, you could say, surrounded by India. Yes, you have this border along here with China, but remember, this is the southern flank of the Himalaya Mountains. So essentially, Ch uh, the Nepalese are looking south down into India. They're essentially surrounded by India. Bhutan over here, surrounded for the same reason by India and in all for all intents and purposes. And Bangladesh over here, uh, if almost surrounded by India. And so India is sort of a dominating presence on the subcontinent. It will not surprise you that India has intervened militarily in all these countries, including in Sri Lanka to the south. India considers herself to be the big power on the subcontinent. India is not a superpower like the United States, a global, with a global footprint. It doesn't have that type of power projection. But on the subcontinent, India certainly sees herself as the predominant power. And it does not like interference from outside powers, especially like from China and the United States. Let me give you an example of that. After World War II, when the Cold War was starting, the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, the United States was looking for, for bases around the world, uh, you know, to establish a, a string of, 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 uh, of, of uh, points of control uh, to protect the sea lanes and tie together its allies against the Soviet Union. And the United States went to the Sri Lankans here and said, hey, look, uh, you know, uh, we would like to hire, rent out this uh, location here and establish a U.S. Uh, naval base here at Trincomalee. This is a deep water protected port. And of course, the United States, you know, obviously we'll rent that from you if you will allow it Sri Lanka. All right. When India heard about that, the thought that Sri Lanka would allow an outside power to come in here, it got extremely defensive and told Sri Lanka, if you approve of that, we will invade you. And they were quite serious about that. And of course, the United States never got that base at Trincomalee. It just shows you how India sees herself as a superpower and is very protective about the subcontinent. Just like the United States considers the Western Hemisphere, North and South and Central America, to be its backyard, since the, since the Monroe Doctrine of, what, 1823, the United States has considered that, however disrespectful that may be, India has acted the same way on the subcontinent. You can understand why Pakistan, therefore, gets a little defensive about the, 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 the presumptions of India on the subcontinent. All right. Now, let's end this second lecture on the subcontinent at this point. I'll continue in part three momentarily.